Um, uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another good, good morning or good afternoon. Salime, good morning, Salime. Good afternoon, Laura, and uh, welcome to another session of Tehran Islamic Studies Monitor. Uh, and in the second series, as I said, as I told before, we are we are, we are focused on we are focusing on uh, Islamic philosophy and theology. And this session, we will talk about uh, Laura's Laura Hassan's book on on uh, Saif al-Din al amadi which is called Ash'arism Encounters Avicennism. Uh, and I will begin by a brief introduction of the, uh, the the guests, and then we'll pass to Laura for give a brief idea of her book. And then to Salime to uh, give her comments about the book and about, and again, uh, to Laura to give some responses. And after all that, we will uh, have some questions and answers uh, before uh, bring, it, the, bring, bring the session to a close. Um, uh, Laura Hassan is currently faculty associate of the Oriental Institute at the University of Oxford, uh, where she teaches Islamic theology and philosophy. She studied, studied the Arabic and Islamic studies with Syriac at Pembroke College, Oxford, and in Fez and Alexandria, before completing her postgraduate studies at the School of Oriental and African Studies, University of London. Her first monograph, uh, which is the current work on the discussion, uh, won the 2018 Gorgeous Press Classical Islamic World Book Prize, which is, as everybody here knows, on the medieval Ash'ari theologian and jurist Saif al-Din al -Omedi. She works on the thought of Ibn Sina and Fakhradin al-Razi also, uh, to whom al amedis theology responds. She has a particular interest in theological issues arising where competing worldviews meet, whether at the intersection of theology and philosophy, at the boundaries of religions, or where the realms of science and religion come face to face. And Salima Maksudlu is a postdoctoral fellow at McGill University, where she works on theorizing models of rationality and spirituality in the Islamic context and its significance for rewriting the intellectual history of the Islamic world between 1200s and 1500s, 1200s and 1500s. Uh, she was also a postdoctoral associate and lecturer in the Council on Middle East Studies at Yale Macmillan Center working on the interrelation between different systems of thoughts within the Islamic world and during the classical, the classical period. In 2016, she defended her doctoral dissertation in Islamic studies at Ecole Pratique de Hautes Etudes uh, in, pa in Paris, where she formerly accomplished her master's degree in the same field. In her dissertation, which was an analytic study of uh, Ayn al-Ghudat al, al saw thoughts, Salime investigated the blurred boundaries between Avicenna philosophy, Ash'ari theology, and a nascent Ghazalian Sufism during the first decades of the 12th century. She also showed how al Hamadani, in search for a proper theory, embraced Avicenna's philosophy with all the conundrum that such adaption would create in a post Ghazalian area. Uh, so, th thank you both for accepting the invitation. I'm really glad to have you here. Um, uh, let, let's begin by Laura, and uh, uh, Laura, please tell us uh, why why did you come to do this, 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 kind, of, this kind of research, and then uh, go on to Salima. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for inviting me. It really is a privilege to be here, and, and especially to have had my book read by, <laughs> by Salima, and uh, you know, to be able to have this conversation. It's its really thrilling after you spend so long <laughs> working on something on your own to have the chance to talk about it. So thank you. And yeah, um, to say a bit about the kind of journey to this research and through the research. And, you know, I do describe it as a journey. I still do. I still think about in Al Amadi in new ways, you know, even after having published the book. And I'm looking forward to hearing people's insights today. Um, but it began with a keen interest in Islamic theology in general and this kind of sense that something exciting, something underexplored is happening in the writings of the, these theologians who, who are working in the aftermath of it, in the uh, philosophy. I think we lost Mohsen, but hopefully he uh, he's he's still here, I think. Good to hear. Yeah, I'm here. I, I just uh, turn off okay. my, my video to have the best, uh, to have better. Oh, fine. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so, and, and this, I guess this much has been known for, for the last few decades, thanks to Gutas and, and others. Um, 
But, you know, Al-Amadi was an instantly appealing figure in this regard. Um, there are two, mine isn't the first monograph on Saifuddin Al-Amadi, so there's already two book-length studies of his thought. And the first is, of course, uh, Bernard Weiss's masterpiece on his jurisprudence, The Search for God's Law, uh, which is a very detailed and close study of his, his methods in jurisprudence. And then secondly, there's an Arabic uh, monograph by Hassan Nashafi of Al-Azhar, um, on Alamadi's opinions and Kalam, but what neither of those uh, authors had the opportunity to do, uh, partly because they didn't have, uh, you know, access to some of the manuscripts of Alamadi's works, and partly because it wasn't their their kind of uh, research question and agenda, was to look at the relevance of Alamadi's engagement with falsafa and um, with Ibn Sina to his theological project. Um, so, so you know, it's an instantly appealing a project. Um, for this reason, how do we reconcile the fact that al writes these works of, of falsafa? Um, and in fact, you know, one of his works of falsafa, Keshfa Tamwihad, Visharat wa Tinbihad, is a response to Bakhruddin al-Razi's commentary on Ibn Sina. And on the basis of just the fact that that work existed, uh, Gutas initially kind of categorizes al as an Avicennist. You know, when he first laid out the kind of uh, bare bones of what he thought was going on in the post avicenna period. That's where he put Al-Amadi. Um, but on the other hand, of course, he's, he's still an influential Ashley theologian, and, and, and that's clearly an important part of his legacy. So, so there's this question, how do we reconcile the fact that he, he did these two things? Uh, and, you know, you might approach the question by saying, did he successfully integrate the paradigms? Uh, or you might also say, um, was that even what he wanted to do? Uh, was, you know, was he interested in integrating the paradigms uh, or was it just that he was engaging with the, the intellectual trends around him? So those are some of the questions I started off with. And I imagine those are some of the same questions, Dr. Salima, that you've engaged in, in studying on Hamadani. Um, and uh, just to concrete that a little bit, I don't want to go on too much, but um, I decided to approach this through a study of his doctrine of creation, precisely because, you know, the, the idea that the world came to exist uh, from nothing, uh, after having no existence of its own, was just absolutely foundational for centuries or, and generations of Ashley theologians. Uh, so it's at least interesting to consider what happens to that doctrine uh, when a theologian starts to take on aspects of metaphysic of a metaphysical system that's in some ways, you know, foreign, basically, in terms of the paradigms for discussion, in terms of the priorities, and, and in terms of the bare fact that uh, the philosophers, with the exception of Al-Kindi, of course, for, for decades, for centuries, had, had said that the world is eternal. So, yeah, that's why I chose the doctrine of creation. And just to say a little bit of, you know, what happened as I, as I undertook the research, al Ahmadi really became for me this, this lens through which to look back at early Asherism, uh, and to an extent to look forward at the later tradition, although I didn't do that much in the book at all, barely, barely really looked forward, but that's another interesting thing to do through al Amity's writings. Mostly I look back um, and, you know, he's writing at this pivotal point. So then, and, and so much seems to be at stake, you know, intellectually, theologically. Um, and also, you know, I argue in the book that for al Amity himself, a lot is at stake personally, uh, socially, financially, politically, you know, it's, it, None of this happens in a, in a vacuum. Um, and so this, you know, allowed me to ask, hopefully from an Amadi's perspective, number one, what is it about Avicennism that is so compelling and that can't be avoided uh, by these theologians? Um, and, but on the other hand, what is it that makes an Ashari an Ashari? And what is it, what are those core identity markers of an Ashari that, you kind of can't relinquish or, or that you have difficulty um, setting to one side when you're faced with an alternative. Um, but what really becomes a theme of my research is that al Amdi is constantly responding to Fakhruddin al-Razi. And that answers a lot of the puzzles about how his works to relate, relate to each other because he's this amazingly skilled dialectician and he's answering uh, Fakhruddin al-Razi who is already a very prominent and very important figure in the uh, encounter of these two kind of paradigms. So, um, and you know, there are I, I consider that there are problems inherent to that, uh, and that in some ways Al Amadi's approach is better suited to jurisprudence. His 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 methods and his 
sort of intellectual priorities um, yield more in terms of jurisprudence than when you than in in the field of philosophy and, and theology. But we can go into that if if it comes up. But um, I think I leave it there and see. Uh, yeah, what uh, Dr. Salima would like to share about her impressions of the work. Thank you. Um, yeah, it is interesting that. Uh, Salime, you, you have done quite the same, but about Ainaladat al Hamadani. And it would be interesting to see, to, to hear your comments about Laura's book, especially about her, uh, her structure of the book and her argument in, in specific. And the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, thanks. Um, um, so I, I, I would love to, to talk with Laura, you know. Uh, about um, our shared uh, topics, um, but I'm going to focus. I'm I, unfortunately I'm not going to say anything about that, Hamadani. Maybe for for another time. Uh, but I would love for us to you know to sit down on a uh, in a cafe, hopefully in near future, <laughs> and talk about what these people did uh, with Avicenism and Asharism. Uh, so I'm going to focus only on on, on the book. Um, um, so, um, I would say that, you know, um, um, so I'm, but, uh, I, um, I, I would start first with a very brief, uh, survey of what I think are some of the highlights in, in, uh, al Amadi's doctrine of creation, uh, which for me, which I found quite interesting. Um, and then I'm going to ask a few questions, but um, already you, you uh, uh, Laura, pointed to, to the big puzzle for me is that, you know, how, uh, if, you know, what was appealing in Avicenna, why they, did, they took Avicenna and why they did some part, why they, they, they took some parts and that, then um, uh, um, didn't choose some other parts. So uh, by no means, I should say that what I'm going to say, do justice to Dr. Laura Hassan's uh, thorough analysis of al Amadi's thought on the subject of creation. Um, the book um, uh, is extremely rich uh, to, to the reader's uh, 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 delight. Laura is a very, very fine analyzer. She goes very deep into the depth of the, of the topic. She brings, up, she brings out, uh, as she just said, all the undercurrents. So uh, you just... You don't only read uh, um, um, Al Amidi, but you also get to know uh, Al Shahrasani's point of view, Al Ghazali's point of view, uh, Fahreddin Al Razi's uh, contribution to the topic. And as she said, uh, Fahreddin Al Razi is the main interlocutor to to whom he he uh, he uh, he looks when he he writes um, in, uh, his books. Uh, so Laura puts the topic really into context, and this. Uh, contextualization is extremely helpful, especially considering uh, the degree of difficulty with which the Kalam treatises are written. Um, everyone who read, uh, who has read the Kalam book, knows that it's not it's not just a given fact to identify the point of argument when you know on the first reading uh, uh, of of the Kalam uh, book. Uh, um, there is a a famous joke uh, that the French specialist of Kalam, Daniel Jumaret, uh, wrote. Uh, so he wrote that reading a Kalam book is like uh, um, is like um, entering entering a house where the members of a family are having an argument, and you don't know who's who. And what are they arguing about? So I think I really thank Laura for uh, for uh, making visible who's who, uh, who's talking to who, and what's the point of argument. Um, and this is why this book, I think, is quite fit for anyone, any non-specialist who's curious to know more about the falsafa kalam uh, uh, development during the post-classical uh, period. So now to the book itself. Um, thematically, the book has two parts. The first part <clears throat> is about al Amadi's life and work. Uh, we learn that al Amadi was a talented guy who was born in Amid in today Turkey. Uh, it is uh, so as it, as, it, as it was custom uh, during that time and now. Uh, he, this talented guy, came to the big cities. Uh, 
uh, to study. He received the basic education in Hanbali tradition. Then he switched to, to the Shafi tradition. And it was during this time in Baghdad that he came into contact with Avicenna philosophy. Uh, but as uh, Laura mentioned, uh, he um he went to Cairo he, actually he moved a lot he went to Cairo uh, eventually he came in he came to Syria and settled there and there he saw the patronage of a Ubid princess and became became a very famous jurist and uh, became the head of a madrasa there but probably because he had a difficult character he also attracted enemies and um, and slanders, and because of these courtly slash scholarly antagonisms, he fell from grace uh, shortly before his death and was put under house arrest and died in 631 of Hijri or 1233 of the Common Era. So this is a bit, little bit of a you know biographical background that Laura uh, shows very interestingly in the book. Uh, what stands out, in my opinion, from this uh, biographical part of the book is the complex relationship that Fahreddin al-Amidi maintained with Avicenna philosophy and Ash'ari theology on the one hand, and with Fahreddin al-Razi particularly on the other. Uh, it's this, in, this intriguing relationship, uh, I mean, it is intriguing for me because um, he, you know, um, he starts off with falsafa, and then he ca he came to kalam, and which is quite unusual if we compare it, for example, to Al Ghazali's uh, example or Fahreddin Al Razi's example, and they all uh, came into uh, falsafa after studying before, you know, after studying kalam. So first came kalam for them, then falsafa. Whereas for him. Um, it's the, quite the opposite, and I was curious to know your opinion why he he made such a move. Uh, what's you know compel, what what was what compelled him to change uh, um, his orientation in intellectual uh, in his intellectual career? This is one point that I uh, want you. Uh, I mean, I would love to you uh, to expand on it. The second part of the book. And which is the core of the book is the analysis of the Ash'ari and Avicenna understanding of creation. And you, uh, uh, Laura, clearly shows that you know there are two paradigms. And we know uh, at least from Herbert Davidson's 1987 study that the way uh, one understood God's characteristics had a bearing on the way one. Um, describe the modality of creation. So basically, the two subjects were interconnected. Uh, with regard to, to, and here I'm focusing especially on creation because I think it's the, the most thrilling part of the book, but Laura analyzes also all the basic uh, components of, of the uh, topic of creation, which is the concept of causality, the concept of, um, you know, uh, possibility. These are all uh, uh, um, very fine uh, parts of the book. But here I'm going to focus on uh, what the type of the types of innovation that al Amadi brought into the topic of creation, um, which I think were were quite uh, fantastic. And um, they beg the question actually uh, why he would do that, what's the implication? So for Ashari, it is absolutely paramount uh, to maintain a very strong sense of God's attributes of volition and power. Um, uh, for them, volition is the capacity of differentiating something from its similar. Uh, the most common ex uh, commonplace example is God uh, picking a very specific moment for the creation of the world. Uh, so this Ashari conception of possibility the, uh, of creation uh, of of um, uh, of uh, sorry this uh, specific uh, uh, conception of possible is is uh, means that for for the Ashara Asharite possible the concept of possible is not physical uh, but it's uh, it's mainly logical uh, and for them uh, 
the possibles are a series of multiple synchronic uh, alternatives that are all available to God, and God, as a choosing agent, picks one of them. Uh, uh, which means that uh, for them, the act of creation is actually uh, a temporal sequence of non-existence and then existence because they believe that you know uh, uh because they believe in their this certain concept of causality for god and for classical ashari's as a consequence the determinant of causeness is this temporal originatedness the, the fact that something comes into existence after not having been and here it is here that happens a very important rift with the Ashari tradition in al Amadi, uh, because he firmly believed that it is the essential possibility that, that determines the causeness. Uh, in, in other words, the effect relies on its cause because it is in itself possible, not because it has come into existence after being non, non existent. And as a result of this belief, al Amadi does not need the doctrine of creation ex nihilo, the fact that uh, the word was created out of nothing to prove God's existence. And everybody who has read a Kalam book knows that, you know, uh, classic, uh, usually you have both uh, one after the other. And you show that, you know, this this not this is not the layout of al uh books of Kalam. For him, the two topics of, are separated because uh, the, the creation ex nihilo does not have that theological uh, significance. Another big break that happens with classical Asharism is in his concept of divine causality, the way he conceptualizes the, the, God, the divine attribute of volition. Asharism and Avicennism disagree over the eternity of the word, partly because for Avicennism, the word is the product of God's essence, and what God's essence is eternal. Therefore, the, the effect must be eternal. I'm, I'm simpli simply simplifying, you know, outrageously here, but this is just the, the gist of the argument. So the word is brought into existence by, by God's essence in Avicenna, but for the Asharites, the God is brought, uh, the, the word is brought in, uh, into existence by God's volition and power. And therefore, as a as a product of this, uh, of God's uh, attributes, uh, the word is a delayed effect. So the act of creation is a is a is a delayed effect uh, is a delayed act, um, um, uh, because for Avis, uh, for Asharites, uh, God is a is um, an agent cause, not a, not an efficient cause. So the uh, effect of uh, so then it be any, an agent cause does not act by determination or necessitation. Um, where, why the way al amidi uh, conceptualizes um, uh, divine causality is, is something in the middle because from on the one hand, he believes that uh, the word is the product of God's uh, uh, volition and power, but on the other hand, he introduces a new element which he took from uh, uh, Fahreddin al Razi's um, al al Aliya, and this new element is uh, the concept of ta'alluh, the fact that even though God's attribute of volition, for example, is eternal, its ta'alluh, its application to its effect is not eternal, it's something that occurs. And it once, but one, once it occurs, this, it has a necessitating effect on its cause. And so he's, he's, he's um, and as you said, you know, he took it from a Razi, there are some connections with, uh, with Abu al-Barakat al-Baghdadi's um, concept of causality. But I was curious to know if you can expand more why he did such a, such a move, why he, he, he borrowed this element from Arazi, and Arazi says that it doesn't work because at the end of the day, uh, what's the ontological status of this ta'allo, and why, what does it make to arise at a certain time? So, 
Uh, if you can say, you know, I know that it is very special, but this is, I, I think this is one of the fantastic uh, innovations that he makes in his, uh, in his doctrine of creation. Uh, but at the same time, it fails. Um, so if you can, if you can say why he did such a move, why he did such a, uh, such a modification, why he, he, he brings this new element and why it does, I mean, it, it, which at the end of the day, it doesn't work. So why is it, what is he trying to do in his doctrine of creation? Uh, so he does the same, uh, the same thing with, uh, the, uh, eternal will because, uh, uh, he, he words his phrases in a way that it implicit, that he implicitly, uh, insists to the fact that an eternal will can produce an eternal effect. Then this is what the posterity, uh, starting from al Iji takes from him is that, you know, al amidi is the only Asharite who believed that, uh, um, you know, uh, an, 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 an agent, a divine agent who possesses a will can produce an eternal effect. So this is actually, this, this you know, uh, uh, web of misconceptions that arises from his book, from his, his books, uh, and which reflects, in my opinion, uh, his undecidedness and his, uh, his uh, state of, Non committing to one particular, specifically Ash um, uh, position is quite fascinating, and I would love you to to expand more on it. So, um, if I want to specify, so these are my. Uh, this is actually, uh, I think, these are some. It's just just a glimpse into Laura's book, um, and I encourage everyone who's interested to go and read the book. But at the same time, I wanted to know. Um, if he can delineate something as al Amidi's intellectual project, so that is he trying to do? Is he is he trying to build an intellectual project by picking elements from Avicenna, from Ashariism, from Arazi, but that um, at the same time, why he criticizes a lot Fahadin Arazi, who who does the same thing? Is he out of you know simple rivalry? He does he, that he kind of tries to promote his own intellectual project. If there is such a thing that you, uh, you can uh, detect in Al Ahmadi's uh, uh, works, um, that that's I think that's one of my question is that is he simply you know what the, his criticism toward uh, towards um, Fahdin Arwazi is is it just out of a genuine concern for the coherence of the Ash'arite uh, uh, system of thought, or is just that you know what you term uh, dialecticism? Dialecticism is um, another thing. Is is that um, you know? And this is I will end on this this point. Is uh, what you term is the waning. Uh, um, Place is the is the is the biggest status of physics for these for these thinkers that they took Avicenna, uh, they took Avicenna's metaphysics, but their commitment to to Avicenna's uh, to Avicenna's physics is just um, absent, and at the same time, their commitment to Ajari physics is also is less and less to the point that Al Amidi, who started uh, a firm Ash'ari believer in atomism in his Qayyat al-Maram, he just uh, abandons the the, um, uh, the the doctrine of the theory of atomism. So I I was I was wondering if they all knew that I was uh, I metaphysics without its physics is bound to fail. Or it's just that, you know, they try to make it work, but they realize that, you know, at the end of the day, it doesn't work. Um, and this is my, the last point that uh, I, uh, so I'm, I, I end here. But any, anyhow, I really enjoyed the book. It is, it is quite, quite fascinating. And I just add another point is that this is a praise of Laura's book. 
is that despite the richness of the book, it is written with a very in a very uh, pedagogical spirit. So uh, don't be afraid of the details that you see. It is extremely clear, and it's 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 fantastic that um, Laura has written it with a in such a clarity. Uh, so I'm done. Thank you. I hope that I didn't exceed my time. Probably. Uh, so that's it. For that's me. All good. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's, it's on time uh, and we'll get back to Laura and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. I, I just want to say thank you so much for reading the book so carefully and it's so um, <laughs> rewarding to kind of hear my arguments you sp spoken back so clearly like they made sense and you understood them so that's great. Um, but I, and, and I just, you know, on the first point, the Daniel Jimare joke is so true. You know, Bernard Weiss describes um, and Amity's jurisprudence, especially as basically unreadable, because it, the reader isn't the person that Amity has in mind. Uh, the, the context for this is is discussion, is live dialectic, and and what we have in the works is is a record of the outcomes of that, of the best outcomes of, of the of the arguments. Uh, you know, the best evidence for each position, and and you know, it means. So, just for example, you know, you have a. A, a question is the world eternal and then you have a whole uh, variety of posi possible positions um, followed by arguments for those positions and then only after all those arguments for the positions you get a response to that and so as you say it's incredibly uh, difficult sometimes to really hear an Amity's voice and and in some ways you know I'm coming more and more to the conclusion that that's not the point that and Amity's not looking for fresh insights, and um, and and the point is more. Um, and we, I'll talk about this a little bit more. But the point is more about preserving creed um, without ignoring the context, and that's what Kalam is so great at, in a sense. That's what Kalam is set up for: is is being open to and and being knowledgeable of all the possible opposition um, points of opposition to one's own view, uh, and dealing with those. Um, but I do ultimately come to conclusion, the conclusion that this, and, and you've kind of hinted at this, that um, it's not ultimately successful in terms of the doctrine of creation. And I'll explain, you, you know, you, you rightly picked up on this notion of ta'alluq as a really important idea. Uh, first of all, uh, I'd like to explain that what, one of the things that I think binds al-Amadi and leads to the fact that he you know, to my mind, to my reading, doesn't ultimately successfully defend the doctrine of creation ex nihilo, is that he, along with all the generations of his his era and of, of his um, his environment, the theologians of his time, accepts the principle of preponderance as being the main thing that sets apart, uh, that, that um, makes the world require a cause, the principle of turajjuh. Uh, as opposed to the principle of taqsis, particularization. Now, um, to clear something up right from the outset, um, classical ashris, of course, absolutely have this notion that the, the world is contingent. Uh, and, and, you know, they do distinguish between God's necessity and the world's contingency. It's a central possibility. It doesn't have to exist. Um, but for them, these two categories are absolutely synonymous uh, with eternality and hudud, temporal originatedness. So God's, God is necessary because he has always existed. He's always existed because he's necess necessary. They, they, the, the two come together. Um, it's not an ontological point. It's not about a mode of existence or a way of existing. And that's where, um, that is why then Ibn Sina's idea that it's, in, in the very existence of these beings that um, they're either necessary or possible is so appealing because it's very, very close to what's already there, but it just adds and secures this ontologically, adds another layer to it, another level to it. So Al-Ahmadi and Fakhreddin Razi and others accept this principle of Turaju. Now this leads to a problem because what this means is that you have to accept that any effect requires a preponderating cause. Absolutely anything that comes into existence um, does so because there's something that weighs in favor of its existence, that, that, that gives it this existence over non-existence. And 
they recognize, Al Ahmadi and Fakhreddin al Razi ultimately recognize that this has to apply even to uh, uh, the action of an agent cause. There has to be something within an act um, that's, in a sense, necessary, that gives necessity uh, to the possible of existence. So, for um, Bakilani, for instance, the agent cause is totally unlike a, necess a necessitating cause, an essential cause, I exactly as you said, Salima, because uh, there's nothing that compels it to a particular course of action. Um, and and they do have within their ontology a, a different idea, the notion of an illa, which is a determinant cause. So, for example, the accident of knowledge uh, creates um, is the illa is the determinant cause of that substrate being knowing. So very limited within their ontology, this kind of cause, but it's there nevertheless, this idea of an illa. Um, and, and of course, the idea is that all other uh, effects that we observe are the direct creation of the agent cause, which is God, and that he's not in any way compelled to behave in a certain way or to choose one particular cause of action. But... Um, <laughs> Because Al Ahmadi and Fakhreddin al Razi accept the principle of preponderation, they they begin to have a problem with this idea of will, and this is why Al Ahmadi introduces the idea of ta'alluq. That he, because he's answering the question which the philosophers have posed, and particularly Ibn Sina has posed: What is it that makes God choose a particular? I'm not sure that I'm fully uh, expressing this from an ontological point of view. Um, but, but they have this problem, you know, there must be a change, essentially, a change in God um, that's causing uh, the world to come to be after it was not. And, um, and this cause itself must have a cause because, it, it, because it's an effect. It, anything that comes into an existence has to have a, a preponderating cause. So they have this problem of an infinite regress of, of uh, causes within the will of God. And so, you know, al Amadi's proposal is to recognize that, okay, God's will is eternal, therefore it can't change, we acknowledge this. Uh, and therefore, there can't be something in the will itself that brings, that preponderates the existence of the world at some point in time, or at some point after having not, you know, that particularizes the existence of the world after it doesn't exist. Okay, so then we postulate that it has to be the, has to be the connection of his will with that moment, with that point, with that um, uh, second of creation. Um, and, okay, why is he, you know, this isn't a solution. <laughs> this isn't really a solution. Uh, and this is uh, kind of what you've highlighted. And, and Arazi uh, treats this argument in the Matalib, as you've, as you've mentioned, and says and highlights that there's a problem with this because you know that I look what brought the I look into existence, <laughs> what made God's will uh, particularize this moment over another, and it leads to an infinite regress. So why does Alamadi stick with it? And that was your question. <laughs> that was your initial question. Uh, I think there's there's a kind of um, um, intellectual reasons as well as pragmatic reasons. So on an intellectual level, um, as I've said, he accepts the principle of preponderation of Torajo. And that forces him to, to say that there's got to be something that changes in God's will in order to bring the world into existence. So that, that pushes him into this corner, essentially. Um, but in a Razi, in the Matalib, we see what happens when you reject that idea and when, when, or when you, when you show that there's a problem with that idea. Because what happens in the Matalib is that Arazi is unable to solve the problem. He's unable to, to um, create a defense of creation ex nihilo. Now, I, I've just uh, sent off final proofs of an article in which I actually argue that he does have a position, that Arazi does have a position on creation in the Matalib, and this is against the current kind of consensus. Um, but that that's in the absence of a solution to this problem, that he does... Um, find other evidence and and part of that evidence is from the fitra and from his uh, reflections on nature and from other other kind of evidence sources and uh, he does conclude that the world is created in time uh, but he doesn't resolve this problem of how how does an eternal will produce a temporal world and that doesn't mean that he 
thinks that Ibn Sina has the solution. He doesn't. And, and he shows that there are problems for the eternalists as well. And in particular, I argue that uh, Arazi uh, shows that Ibn Sina has a problem with the, the presence of multiplicity in the world, that you can't have this essential necessitating cause um, and also uh, the presence of particularization of, mul of uh, clear variation and of a sequence of events. Uh, Ar Razi shows that Ibn Sina has a problem with this. Um, and uh, yeah, that, but that's, a, that's an argument of a separate paper. But uh, the point is that I think this is why Al Amadi settles <laughs> on the Ta'alluq solution. Because actually, um, the, the acceptance of the principle of Torajo backs these theologians into a corner and they've got nowhere else to go. And for Arazi, he's a bit more comfortable uh, with this, what well, I describe it as uh, epistemic humility. And uh, now that there's lots of people working on Arazi at the moment and there's different ways of articulating this, but uh, he's comfortable with saying, no, our intellects can't attain this. Um, but that doesn't mean that we can't affirm a particular point of view. It doesn't mean we can't have a conviction. Arazi is comfortable with that. And Amadi, like, and I would argue this is kind of a product of his heritage, he's not so comfortable with that. You have to uh, come to a conclusion and, and, and you have to show that you've got evidence for that. And that's, you know, that is actually foundationalism. That's, that's actually epistemology. Um, and sure, that doesn't necessarily always have to be certain truths. Uh, and that in this field of jurisprudence, that's especially the case. What do you do when you can't attain an epistemological absolute in jurisprudence? You definitely want to come to the best possible opinion. You don't want to just go for doubt or ignorance. And that's fine in the field of jurisprudence. And that's entirely appropriate. It's a little bit more problematic in theology. Um, but Al Amadi wants to preserve the Ashari creed, um, and there's a pragmatism about that. Uh, we need to know what we believe, and uh, and we need to be able to defend it. And I think that's so. So there's uh, so far I said two reasons: intellectual uh, pragmatism in terms of preserving creed and giving people justified basis to believe what they believe, but also certainly this major undercurrent, which is rivalry with Arazi. Um, uh, yeah, and I, I think these, none of the, maybe, perhaps it's the case that none of those reasons is enough on their own, but when they come together, th there's a good reason to settle with something that isn't an, an ideal uh, and to go with something that's not an absolute. Um, but said, I mean, I, it's really difficult to, it, I always feel like it sounds like I'm exaggerating about the Razi uh, uh, exchange, but it's difficult to understate just how you know, every page of Afkar al Afkar, you find an idea from Arazi, a, an argument from Arazi, although he never mentions him by name in Afkar al Afkar, although, he, you know, it's, it's obviously him. Um, yeah. Yeah, you know, it's funny, uh, and here I interrupt you, it's funny because I had the same kind of uh, um, discovery, the aha moment, with, uh, while I was working on, on, uh, on Qunawi. Who's, who's a Sufi? Who was uh, who also did a lot of philosophy and and kalam, and it, his main he speaks with actually he uh, with Parhadan Razi, and it's it's fascinating that we are we all we uh, obviously we all know that um, during uh, that uh, we entered the sixth uh, history uh, century with with uh, with Ghazali, but, and we ended with Fahruddin and Razi. And it is, you know, through such analysis, with, such as your work, that we also, we come to, to the understanding, to the real understanding, how important the fig figure of Al Razi was for these uh, these other intellectuals. And I, I, I discovered the same thing in my own work that, you know, they all talk to Al Razi in their, in their head. So <laughs> yeah. it was, he was present there, and they were they all uh, kind of responded to him, even if never they never mentioned his name. Yeah, yeah, and and I mean, I, as I as I see you, know, he doesn't mention him by name, but he describes him as mutafalsafat al al you know, the the philosophizer, and it's a dig, isn't it? It's you know, and um, and it's both just a question of rivalry and and patronage. I mean. 
there's there's one the, the bio, so the interesting thing about al amadi is that the biographical sources differ so much as to the reasons that he faced controversy but ibn wasil has this um amazing uh, almost funny account of how like um al razi had more horses than al amadi and he had more more of everything he goes through all the things that um, al razi was favored with and then al amadi is just this poor figure in the corner like angry with al razi and <laughs> um and you know wanting to get back at him um and i'm sure there's some truth in that but there's also a more pragmatic more practical um thing which is that you know where does that actually take you and what i'm finding really interesting i don't i haven't studied very much the later actually theologians to be honest but as i do i'm discovering that the whole episode where arazi suspends judgment on loads of key questions or um or shows that he's unable to resolve uh, you know these big problems including uh, the question of creation including the question of the atom including the question of are there immaterials in existence and that whole episode the later the legends are very quiet as far as i can tell they the things are more of a closed uh, uh, you know I, uh, this is my impression though only and also from talking to other scholars of atafzani and other people like that is that um there is something uncomfortable about what arazi does it's very it's risky from a theological and ideological point of view and i think that in an amadi we see like a contemporary response to that level of risk uh so yeah um i just want to make sure that i'm answering some of the other things you asked cuz i've gone on about that one question um yeah your first question about you know why is why does al amadi start off with falsafa and muta kalam this is really a still a puzzle for me um and you know other scholars have there's a the alamdi's earliest work of philosophy and nur al bahir seems to date from his time in baghdad and in that work he apparently uh, is very favorable towards abbasan philosophy um he doesn't do much in the way of uh, expanding it it's still al amdi he's very much al amdi because one of my thoughts was you know is this really him uh writing as an avasan and uh philosopher writing with this voice supporting the doctrine of the eternity of the world for example this like kind of thing it's absolutely him because his method is the same so he he will take a doctrine uh from the shifa take an uh, theory from the shifa for example and subject it to this dialectic and and just deal with opposing beliefs and he, so he does he has very much the same method um but he doesn't show any commitment to kalam there Now there is this thesis going around and and Griffo is about to publish a book about this and I'm look, I'm really looking forward to seeing how he works this out and how what his evidence is. Um that theologians like Al Amdi um wrote these works just to provide this kind of exposition of falsafa and exposition of kalam on the other hand and it didn't matter that they were doc, uh, doctrinally contradictory. Um this doesn't really ring true of Al Amdi um and you know all of his later works of falsafa uh, are, are very different in character so he has rumuz al-qunuz and daqaiq al-haqaiq unfortunately most of which is not extant but in rumuz al-qunuz he's again he's he has exactly the same topics as in anul bahir so philosophical topics basically going from metaphysics um no sorry you, you, logic physics metaphysics um and yeah so kind of in structure and as a in the paradigm of the work is avicenna but in rumuz al-qunuz he's assessing that philosophy and saying okay this is all fine for now you know we're okay with most of the physics we're okay with the logic and this logic is good it's useful uh, but they're wrong about the eternity of the world they're wrong about the attributes of god and so on uh, so clearly there that's not a work of kind of you know just exposition of philosophy there is there is a a question of well is it true or not <laughs> and is it something that we accept or isn't it um but anor bah doesn't show that his, his earliest work of philosophy and and um there's also a passage in to 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 make things even more complex there's a passage in anor bah um where al amadi kind of complains that he's he's getting old and he hasn't solved the problems of philosophy and he's he's running out of time and some scholars have said okay this must be a later work actually it's got to be a later work that he came to this position later in life uh but the manuscript is dated early and also he doesn't mention any of his later work so i date it early so then you have to say at some stage he changed his mind and 
and yeah, I don't know when that happened. I wish I did know kind of what led him to change his orientation, but it is, it's almost a 360 degree turnaround because in, by the time of Abkola, Abkola, he's highly critical of anything that he associates with philosophy, although he, he, he appropriates other parts, as I've said, you know, he, he takes a lot on board, but it, you know, ostensibly and explicitly, he says, okay, this is a falsafi doctrine and therefore we reject it. And these are the reasons why we reject it. The philosopher are wrong about this. They're wrong about this. They're wrong about this. They're wrong about this. Uh, so it's not that he's just comfortable with two different uh, ways of thinking about things. Um, but there has been a turnaround. And I'm not fully satisfied that I've explained that. So, you know, hopefully somebody can do that in time. But that is what I observed. Um, and, yeah, then just on the... Did you want to say something or we can move to your question about physics? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wanted to say, ask. You know, what do you think about their is is their integration of Avicenna and uh, philosophy, metaphysics minus physics? Does it work or not? Or you yeah. know why? Or they they come into they came into this realization a little bit late, or they knew from the beginning and then kind of uh, kind of tried to fit it in. Yeah, I mean this is this is a really good example of the contrast between Al-Amazi and Al-Razi. Uh, and it's a reason why, one of the reasons that um, the way in which Al-Razi restructures uh, a Kalam endeavor becomes much more influential later on because it, it doesn't work in Al-Amazi. So, so as we said, you know, he accepts this principle of preponderation and therefore he deals not with, you know, his basic... Um, Organizing principle behind his Abkhal of God is this distinction between that which exists by necessity and that which is only possible in its existence. Okay, and that is in contrast to the theologians of his heritage who say, you know, this primary uh, dichotomy is between the Qadim and uh, the Hadith or the Mahdi. Um, so, so that means that he Al Amadi deals with all topics related to uh, God's essence and his attributes first. Then he comes on to deal with physical theory uh, with the world. And so this entails, but the thing about it is that he doesn't depart from the topics of his school. Um, even though he's completely rearranged that basic structure, he still sticks to the basic questions. Is there, what is the nature of matter? Um, is it an indivisible part? Is it, you know, how, and, what are the accidents? How do we categorize accidents? And so on. Um, but so, and within that, his engagement with Avicenna and philosophy is dialectical. And, it, and <laughs> superficial might be the wrong word because it implies that he doesn't, he goes into great detail uh, treating those aspects of the philosopher's physics that are relevant. Uh, but he doesn't take it on its own merit or within its own, um, the, the paradigm within which Ibn Sina develops physics. I mean, what's the goal of physics for, for Ibn Sina? It's uh, to know the, the haqqaiq of uh, bodies insofar as they're subject to motion. So we're looking to know everything we can about a physical body in that respect. Um, that is very, very different, obviously, from the context within which the classical Ashis treated these questions. They were, they did go into detail and they did have fully developed and fully fledged theories about the nature of matter, but this was um, a subsidiary concern and it, it bolstered theological doctrine and, and it was discussed in those kind of contexts. So, Al Amdi doesn't successfully allow those two completely different ways of approaching the subject to meet. And this means that um, he, he hasn't got something, um, he hasn't got a satisfactory way of responding then to Ibn Sina's metaphysics. And just to give an example of that from the book, um, obviously one of the key points of difference between the philosophers and the theologians is uh, the question of whether matter is infinitely divisible or ultimately there are these parts of matter. And obviously the classical Ashley's are atomists. So Alamity sets out to defend this point of view. 
Uh, but he's strongly aware of this competing idea of matter. Very, I mean, it's, it's, it's so much in his environment. It must have been, people must have been talking about it a lot. And, you know, not just in, you know, small scholarly circles, I don't think, I, I don't know. Um, but, so he's strongly aware of it, but at the same time, he doesn't uh, treat the theory of hylomorphism within its own context. He simply is aware of these arguments against the atom, and he, 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 he deals with them all. And ultimately, he suspends judgment on the question of the atom. Um, fine, as fine to come to that conclusion in a sense, but then in a sense, it's not because um, it's it, you know his other proofs for creation rely on that idea of of matter and rely on that idea of, of the way the world works. Um, so, but and then so turning to Arazi, then I mean, there's there's a there's a little bit of uh, maybe not debate, but but nuanced disagreement about how Arazi thinks of physics. Um, but what's very clear is that he at least took Avicenna physics on its own merit and within its own kind of uh, in, within that system. And and uh, you know, Bilal Ibrahim has shown very uh, clearly and persuasively that Al Razi does have a position about the nature of matter, which is different from that of the Ashis and that of Ibn Sina. That he says actually that's something we can't probe. We can't get to the the, the nature of matter at that level. Uh, we we can observe phenomenal bodies, and, and and that's where we can go with that. And so Arazi does have perspectives, and he's not afraid to break with the paradigms of uh, the classical Ashley's in that, or to disagree with Ibn Sina. But still, Arazi, I think, is primarily is more interested in theological questions and in how those physical theories relate to theological questions. Um. So so your question is, you know, were they trying to do yeah, I, I think in, in Alameda you see clearly the case where uh, he's trying to take Ibn Sina's metaphysics or at least parts of it, the best parts of it, uh, and reject the rest, and it's problematic. It, it does, it's not coherent, ultimately, as it, when you really, really look into it, it's not coherent. Uh, yeah, <laughs> there's a long answer to that question. Um, Definitely. So you think that these, you know, so at the end of the day, Arazi was more honest to himself than Al Amidi because you know he he commit the the fact that he he suspends just judgments on some fundamental issues bespeaks that you know he he knew that this doesn't work therefore it's better to just say well uh, I don't know whereas Al Amidi also believe that, but could didn't want to acknowledge that you know. Well, it doesn't work, or <laughs> he didn't have the courage to to say that. Yes, I mean, I, I think that, um, and I, I think that's probably the impression I gave in the book, and that probably would be how I would have described it when I published the book. And I'd still, I still basically agree with that, um, except to say that. I, there's there's very good reasons for that. There's very good reasons um, to need to come to some conclusion um, and to be able to have, yeah, to, to not be, you know, I, I just understand, I just understand from a pragmatic point of view why um, you wouldn't want to necessarily admit these things, admit these problems. Um, but yeah, that is that. I, I think I'm just always conscious <laughs> of the fact that, you know, I'm criticizing this. This, I'm offering this critique of Al Amadi, and of course, these guys were incredible <laughs> philosophers and theologians, and they 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 knew so much, and they had so much technical understanding. And it, I just think that. You know, I would like to have a bit of humility and 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 leave. And, and and although I would say yes, ultimately, I don't think this this um, project succeeds. That that there's aspects of astrism which are undermined, clearly undermined by um, the way in which Al Amadi kind of takes on these these ideas that seem uh, so appealing, but doesn't fully integrate them. 
Um, I, I would like to leave some room for him to have had his reasons for that, if you see what I mean. Um, but yeah, that is, that, that is my conclusion. And in the case of Arazi, I, I mean, it's, it's absolutely fascinating to think where he got to by the end of his life. And it's totally my opinion that he did affirm the doctrine of creation ex nihilo. Um, and that's, as I've said, that's kind of, not everyone believes that that's the case with his thought. Um, but that he, he, he admitted that there, there are different grounds for uh, supporting a particular conviction. And that's not to say that he kind of uh, chose fitra over re a reason and rationality, not at all. Uh, but that he he just acknowledged that when you have these two worldviews coming together, um, they they are a challenge to each other. There is a mutual challenge. I mean, both of them. The fact that you can have philosophers who are so for centuries um, uh, so established in this belief in the eternity of the world and in, in in things about the nature of God, and on the other hand, you have theologians who believe something totally contrary. Even the fact that you have those contradictory beliefs present must mean that there's something which causes people to you know that people don't have this much credence in those beliefs without cause so it's just and, and then you have to deal with that what and this is actually a, a topic that i'm hoping to look for look to in, in future research the topic of disagreement and what happens epistemologically speaking when there's a disagreement like this and we have these disagreements all over the place in our times as well uh world views which are in some respects completely you know, binary in binary opposition to one another come together, and what happens epistemologically? Do we have to admit, like Razi, that maybe this means that <laughs> our evidence isn't so fail idiot proof and so absolutely irrevocably true that nobody could disagree with it? Of course, that is what it means. Um, and, and and but then, what do you do? Do you like an Amity kind of brush it under the carpet and and say, well, we need to keep a clear belief, or do you say like Razi? Uh, there's more than the intellect and also human intellects, all of us, all of our human intellects fall short. Um, is that, that, that I think is where it takes a Razi at the end of his life. None of us are able to get there, uh, but that doesn't mean we can't believe anything. And, and it's fascinating for me to see how, how a Razi resolves that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I was wondering how much of, you know, how much, of what I, I, I call, you know, uh, Rossi's courageousness and El Amity's um, shallowness probably <laughs> is due to the fact that, you know, uh, he had a, he, uh, that Rossi had a much more political power and therefore he dared to say what he wanted to say, whereas uh, 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 an Amity uh, mm -hmm. If, you know, he was afraid of losing his position at the court or whatever, mm -hmm. he just didn't want to show weakness in his doctrine. I mean, it, sure, for sure, there were some consequences. Yeah. Um, anyhow, but... Yeah, but the, that's a very interesting point. Then, you, then you, it also leads you to ask, who was al Ahmadi trying to please? Yeah, uh, you know, like if Ed Razi's thought was because he, he's had so many disciples, his thought was becoming really popular. Was there a, a section of society or a, a scholarly, a level of scholarly discourse which was kind of upset by Ed Razi, bothered by Ed Razi, and and we know that there was from the Manada Arts, for example. You know, mm. he had yeah, exactly. people. So who was there? Somebody in particular, or some group in particular that Al Amadi had in mind that you know, if he could gain their favor. Um, then that that might work in so I'm not I'm not sure I wasn't, I wasn't able to identify a group of people, but it's an interesting question to ask, you know, what who who his alternative would have appealed to. Mm, definitely, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Well, uh, Thank you both for the intriguing discussion. It was very interesting for me at least. Um, if, if you have any further points, please uh, uh, please uh, tell that point. But, uh, but if, if, if it's done, maybe we can, we have some minutes to have some questions from the audience. Uh, we had a raised hand, but from uh, Ayesha or so, uh, but she's now, uh, She's not connected now. I think she is interruption. Um, 
So uh, if you have any questions, uh, if you have any questions, please uh, write it down in the chat or raise your hand so that I, uh, I enable your microphone, please. Any questions? I, I have well, one question myself, but I, I will wait if, if any audience have any questions. Well, anyone wants to have question? No? Great. <laughs> well, I, 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 I have a peripheral question from Salima. Um, I, I just want to take advantage of the situation. <laughs> and I, I, would I, I wonder if you can say something about your current project at McGill and how it relates to the studies on the intersection of Kalam and Falsafa. Uh, because unfortunately, I didn't manage to find anything other than its title. I searched, uh, I, I searched in C C SSHRC page and found the title, which is Theorizing Models of Rationality and Spirituality in the Islamic Context and its Significance for Rewriting the Intellectual History of the Islamic World. Uh, but from the very title, it sounds uh, like it will interestingly contribute to how we should understand the relation between Talsafa and Kalam in the medieval period. Uh, I mean, how your observations uh, make difference in pursuing such project as LORAS uh, to, to relate it to the session, or in general in pursuing any study of the relation between Kalam and Falsafa and medieval world. Uh, could you say something about the, the project and it, the, the influence which may have on, on the study of Kalam and relation between Kalam and Falsafa and the medieval period? Thank you. <laughs> um, um, actually, this project that I'm having now is uh, kind of a continuation that uh, uh, of the work that I have done with the Earth of Avicenna project, which is run, at, uh, which has been running at LMU Munich under the supervision of uh, Peter Adamson. And uh, for that project, I am investigating um, the influence that the Sufis, post-classical Sufis, received from both Avicenna and, and, and Avicenna philosophy and, and Kalam and how the way that they responded to that, uh, that influence. Uh, um, I am, and this uh, project, actually I, I, I wrote it to, uh, um, so this is, this is the continuation of that book. So I, uh, because I was working um, I was translating from Arabic and Persian uh, passages, uh, philosophical passages that we can find in post-classical Sufi works. Uh, so I had the idea of putting it uh, together into a book uh, and then make, uh, you know, to show how, you know, how connected these guys, you know, I talked, uh, I briefly mentioned Ghunabi, how connected these persons were to you know, Fahid al Arazi, Al Amidi, uh, uh, Al Ghazali, which is which is something that has been overlooked in the secondary literature. So this is what I'm trying to do in my project. But this is the continuation of a, of an, another project on which I've been working uh, since a couple of years ago. Uh, so I, what I'm trying to do is to show the connection. Uh, uh, and to say that, you know, th what we consider as, uh, you know, like the main, uh, the mainstay of Akbarian Sufism, you know, the, the disciples of um, um, Ibn Arabi, uh, is very much shaped by their reception of Avicenna and uh, uh, Ash'ari theology. This is what I'm trying to, to, to demonstrate through uh, analysis and translation of uh, of uh, chosen passages from their work. So there, the people people who have uh, who have worked on on the Akbari tradition, um, they knew the connection, uh, but they they didn't go into length to show that. So I'm trying to show you know where the connection happens and how that it contributed to. Uh, to developing a certain uh, philosophical Sufism uh, in the works of Al Ghunavi and his disciples. I'm not touching. I mean, I'm just. I'm not working on on Ibn Arabi himself specifically because his his work is huge and I cannot. Uh, so I have chosen to focus on on Ghunavi and his disciples. Yeah. So this is what I'm doing. 
So great, thank you. Um, and we have a question from uh, Mustafa Musavi, please. Um, yeah, th there you go, Mr. Musavi, Mustafa. Do you have a question that raise your hand? So, uh, okay. Uh, any? Oh, okay. Um, so, any other questions? Well, um, I think we, uh, we we can bring it to a close. And, uh, and thank you very much both. Uh, it was a very interesting discussion for me, uh, and I learned a lot from the from the discussion. I hope uh, we we can have some other occasions to discuss uh, other topics as well. Um, and if you have any further points or final uh, conclusions or observations, I uh, I'm at your service. Thank you very, very much. For yeah, thanks for it. I mean, and to those who attended, I really enjoyed having the opportunity. Thanks, right. thanks for thank organizing you. the session. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for joining. Thank you again, Laura and Salima, for uh, accepting the invitation and uh, having you. And I'm really glad to having you here. Uh, and uh, good afternoon and have a good time or have a good yeah. evening, noon, <laughs> have a good whatever day. time is in your day. Have a good yeah, day. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.